The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Sorry we're getting a little bit of a late start. There's always some technical difficulties that come up. But you have logged on to the Nelson Labs webinar, Slimy Biofilms, a brief overview. Now, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you miss one of our webinars, we'd simply like to refer back to it. You can always uh, find them on the Nelson Labs website under the on-demand webinars page listed under education. You can also receive notifications of upcoming live and on-demand webinars by liking Nelson Labs on Facebook or following on Twitter and LinkedIn. We also invite you to register for the free Soterra Health Academy at soterrahealth.com slash academy. There you will find curated content from industry thought leaders from introductory sterilization and lab testing topics to advanced in-depth learnings from our expert advisors. They have filled this academy with cutting edge educational content and resources to help you mitigate risk, go to market faster, and achieve excellence in your field. Nelson Labs is a leading global provider of laboratory testing and expert advisory services for med tech and pharmaceutical companies. The company performs over 800 rigorous microbiological and analytical laboratory tests across the medical device, pharmaceutical, and protective barrier industries. The experts at Nelson know every test matters and requires solutions to complex problems to improve patient outcomes and minimize client risk. So let's get started. Today we're joined by Dr. Uh, Maggie Butler. Dr. Butler holds a PhD in microbiology from the University of Montana, followed by a postdoctoral training in biochemistry and molecular biology at Dartmouth Medical School. Her research experience includes 15 years in cell biology department at Yale University School of Medicine and four years at the University of Chicago School of Medicine focusing on the structure and the function of proteins involved in membrane trafficking and synaptic uh, communication in both healthy and diseased tissues. Dr. Butler joined Bioscience Laboratories, which is now Nelson Laboratories Bozeman, in 2010 and worked briefly in the clinical laboratory in the Quality Assurance Unit, followed by her promotion to the Department of Scientists in 2012. Her research background on neuronal and uh, signaling mechanisms led to her keen interest in understanding the quorum of sensing that occurs in the life cycle of biofilms. Dr. Butler strives to provide high quality service to our clients and enjoys exploring new developments in our industry. We do encourage your questions and you can submit them at any time during the presentation and Dr. Butler will try to answer as many as she can during the last 10 to 15 minutes of our broadcast. Now beginning the presentation, I'd like to turn the time over to Dr. Butler. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I apologize for being a couple minutes late and I also woke up hoarse this morning but I think it's working itself out, so hopefully you can understand me fine. So today I'm going to give a, a brief overview of biofilms, and because this is such an, an active area, we hope to actually make a series out of it um, so that we can dive deeper into each um, topic uh, that I'll just touch upon today. So today I just want to give a, a very basic um, background on on biofilms and uh you'll see there there is a lot to learn um one thing for sure one that you'll you'll notice this the more we understand about biofilms the more we understand the tremendous complexity of them um it's a it's a fascinating field um, okay, let me just go over my brief outline here, what I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm going to define what a biofilm is, and believe it or not, that's not that trivial. We'll, we'll get to that. 
give some common examples of biofilm that we are all familiar with. Uh, go through the uh, life cycle or the growth and development of a biofilm. Um, the matrix, the slimy matrix, also called the extracellular po polymeric substance, um, is a very critical component of the biofilm. So we will spend a few minutes on looking at its structure and function. Um, I'll go over some of the current anti-biofilm control measures and then some standardized test methods. And I'll touch on uh, the regulatory perspectives. Okay, so what is a biofilm? Like I said, not a trivial question. Um, I just attended a, a global biofilm conference which had leading some of the world's leading experts there. And we spent one half of a full conference day trying to come to a consensus on defining biofilm. So, um, but, but I, you know, I, I have a consensus in my head. I, I think, um, I think you will too. But, but that goes to show you, we're just learning so much more that um, it, it can be, difficult. So even though Antoine Leeuwenhoek actually described a biofilm in 1684, the, the plaque of, found in teeth, the term was not introduced until almost 300 years later. The actual word biofilm was not introduced until the late 1970s. And then after that, it still took another 30 years for the scientific community to um, recognize you know, widespread what, what that biofilm, the word biofilm. But fortunately, in the last 20 years or so, there's been an explosion of interest and research um, on biofilms, mostly, well, for two reasons. One reason is because we have realized that the, their monumental cost and damage to nature, industry, and healthcare is, is tremendous. And so we, we finally understood that. And so now people are, you know, listening. And the second reason and it took so long for biofilms to gain traction is that scientists were used to the dogma that they were taught in their basic biology courses. And that is that bacteria and other microorganisms, for the most part, exist in nature as free floating, just suspended. Um, now we know that over probably 99% of the global microbial mass exists as a biofilm growth pattern, not as free floating bacteria. So those two reasons really held back um the field but fortunately you know right now we're in, in a, a good part of the of the cycle because there's a lot of very active and interesting research going on and i find it um real interesting because we are starting from scratch we're asking very fundamental questions but we're using very high technological equipment and methodology. So, you know, that doesn't happen very often. Um, usually when you're asking these ba basic questions, you're back in the descriptive stage and you, you know, you don't, you don't need all these um, high tech. Okay, so um, at here on this, let's take a look at the slide here. What is biofilm? This is a consensus definition. A uh, biofilm is a community of microorganisms embedded in a slimy matrix, which can attach to various surfaces. Typically, that surface has some moisture. A great diversity of species have been found in biofilms, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And also, you can find other, you can find debris in a, in a biofilm, and you can also find if it's, for example, if it's on a human, you can also find um, components from the host. Um, in the lab, we mostly make a single 
a biofilm made of just one single species because it's easier in nature. They um, usually are multi-species and sometimes can have hundreds of, of organisms, different species. Um, they, biofilms can exist on inert surfaces such as glass, plastic, and metal, but they can also use plant and animal tissues as their substrate. They are ubiquitous. They are found in human tissues and they're found in the deep subsurface rocks. Um, as I already said, biofilms are the natural lifestyle of microorganisms existing in nature, not individual free floating. Um, okay, next slide, please. Um, next, on here, just going to show some pictures of some biofilms. This is a uh, electron um, micrograph of a toothbrush bristle. Um, the what the image on the left is I don't know the magnification, but the one on the right is just a higher magnification, basically of the same bristle. Okay. And next, here's um what uh, Leeuwenhoek saw in 1684. You can see the uh, the yellowish film near the gum line that is um, flat. Okay. And here's a shower head with um, some gunky, slimy stuff on it, uh, biofilm. Next. This is a um, catheter lumen and in the sort of the mat there you see uh, the layer, flat layer inside of the lumen is a biofilm. Okay. Here's a water pipe, um, highly corroded. Uh, due to biofilm growth. Okay. This is actually close to uh, where I am, uh, Bozeman, Montana. This is in Yellowstone National Park. This is a biofilm mat that's found in um, one of the hot springs near the, um, for those of you who've been there, near the Grand Prismatic Pool. Um, so actually, this was, it wasn't the very first biofilm discovered, but it was pretty early. Um, the, they were found here at Yellowstone and, and um, because it's so obvious, right? These mats of, of bacteria growing. Okay. Uh, this is another um, electron micrograph image of um, an implant that has been um, contaminated with um, bacteria on the surface of the of the um, implant material. Okay. And another image here of um, electron micrograph. This is a, I wanted to point out a multi-species biofilm. You can see um, little round um, cocci, those are you know, one species of bacteria. And on the picture on the right, especially, you can see um, rod-shaped bacteria. And then all the other stringy stuff where the, um, the dotted arrows are, that's all the matrix that's um, holding it all together. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll talk about the matrix in just a minute, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about the basically the life cycle of a biofilm, the formation and growth. Okay, so this is a simplified uh, conceptual version. You know, every single step is complicated, and you know we're still collecting a lot of data on each step. But for you know, again, there is a consensus the most among most scientists that these are the basic steps. So planktonic cells first attach to a surface in a, in a monolayer. That's your number one there, the attachment image. Um, this is reversible. Uh, a lot has been studied on what drives that very in, at first, the initial attachment um, from, you know, 
biological needs because the the environment is getting stressful for the bacteria so they get signals turning on saying oh boy i need to make a biofilm because that's a nice shelter for me um that's you know that's part of it another part is surface interactions um non-specific like steric uh forces van der waals um a lot a lot of chemistry a lot of physics a lot of biology anyway let's say they attach then um, number two there the cells begin to aggregate and now they're secreting the slime what i'm going to call the eps for the rest of the talk that's the extracellular polymeric substance um, they begin to secrete that and now it becomes irreversible so if you're in that slime you're probably going to stay there all right and then you go to number three those um, bacteria grow and divide and they start moving from that monolayer to a 3d multi-layered multi structure and, and the light you can see there's this is a multi-species the round circles are one one species of bacteria and then the two the blue and the brown uh, rod shape are two other different species so this has just for representation we have three species the light green um kind of holding it all together is is the matrix so it keeps on um growing and finally it reaches a critical mass and it will release um, as shown here in number four, the, they are all those are all planktonic. However, and when I say planktonic, I mean free floating, uh, as opposed to aggregated. So these cells um, can either the bacteria can either be released as individual planktonic, or a a chunk of the biofilm can come off. Now all these are free to to go find another biofilm and start all over so that's basically the the life cycle of a biofilm okay so that light green matrix in that last picture um is uh, is very critical and as i said i may refer to it as slime simply matrix or um most likely I'll say EPS, but some people call it ECM for extracellular matrix, okay? Next. Okay, the primary components of the EPS, um, it's made up of many, many biomolecules and organics, debris, you name it, um, but the major structural and functional components are dna proteins lipids and polysaccharides and these components contribute to the structural and functional properties of that specific biofilm and keep in mind that it's it's dynamic so that eps is is changing um, Okay, we'll talk about it next. Go ahead. Okay, so what I've done is I've zoomed in. I, if you look on the left-hand side of the figure, I cut out those two bacteria there and zoomed in on that area. So now you see the two big green circles on the right representing the bacteria. And then behind in the light green is the matrix. You can see the, the blue squigglies are um, structural proteins. The small yellow circles represent lipids, the beaded strand represent polysaccharides, and the blue helical structure um, represents the extracellular DNA. So the function of the, the EPS, as I already said, it promotes the adhesion to surfaces. Okay, that's its, its, its first function. Once it starts, it cement, <clears throat> excuse me, it cements the cells together, keeping them in, in close proximity. And by doing this, the this, this different cells can interact with each other intracellularly. And this, this is a, you know, a tremendous um, 
feature of, of biofilms. It can be, I would say most of the time it's synergistic. However, sometimes um, it's competitive, but they usually work it out because um, there are micro niches that form within the matrix. So if you are a bacteria that produces some waste and your the bacteria next to you that that waste is toxic well they're just going to move move away from you so there's there's all these you know um micro environments within the biofilm so that's you know that's another uh function of the matrix um so so they can move around finding where the best environment is that suits their needs and then uh of course, the protection from environmental stresses, um, antimicrobial agents, and immune cells. It has been shown that biofilms can be uh, 1,000 times more resistant to antibiotics than um, free-floating bacteria. Okay. Okay, so I, I mentioned these, the functions of the EPS, uh, adhesion, cell-to-cell -cell communication, providing favorable environment, and protection. And all, all of those, which is provided by the EPS, those are all the major advantages for a biofilm lifestyle over a planktonic lifestyle, okay? Um, there's just a lot more benefits to being in a community than being one lonely bacteria out there trying to survive harsh conditions. Okay. So some current approaches used to study biofilms. Next slide, please. So some uh, scientists study laboratory-grown biofilms, they are obviously easier, um, usually one species, and you can control all the conditions you, you'd like to. Um, there's another group that studies the natural biofilms that they find in nature, bring them back to the lab and, and study them, um, you know, which is, most people would agree that's a better way to do it, but it's so difficult, um, so it, it's just so complex. So we probably have a lot to learn just from growing biofilms in the lab. Um, and all sorts of you know, different perspectives um, from academia, industrial, healthcare. And what, one of my favorite parts of working on biofilms is the interdisciplinary participation. Um, at these meetings, it's, it's wonderful when you have uh, a biologist and an engineer, you know, talking to each other um, in, in great depth. Um, they understand just enough of the other field, but um, this is, it, it, it's wonderful. And of course, the biggest advantage is that's how big strides are made in, in science, usually, is when um, disciplines cross the, their borders and, and learn from, from others. Okay, and um, of course, a big part of all research now on biofilms is on controlling the, the harmful ones. And there are some, um, there are beneficial biofilms. So some people are studying that, but most of the focus is on the, the harmful ones. And um, mostly all the work is in in vitro because human and animal studies are either not ethical or and or not feasible. Okay. Uh, this I just wanted to highlight that I'm gonna focus now, I'll, although all these approaches are super interesting, I'm gonna focus on some of the measures that we take to um, control the harmful biofilms. Okay, next. So this is the how the cost of managing biofilms in, in one year, this is what um, prompted a lot of research. 
So if you look at the um, the pi diagram on, on the left, you'll you'll see the, the light blue that is um, mechanical and civil engineering. That's mostly corrosion, corrosion of um, pipes, you know, bridges, support um, infrastructure. The dark blue is, uh, oops, I'm covered up. I'm sorry, I got mu muted somehow. I apologize. Um, Okay, so you, you can see the, the total 3.9 billion, basically that's 4 trillion. Um, the, the diagram on the right, they've simply just taken out the, the light blue, the corrosion, just to show you, get, get a better view of, of the other um, categories. So basically the big three are uh, corrosion, healthcare, and food and agriculture. Next, please. Okay, what are some of the strategies currently used to control biofilms? Next. So there's preventive measures, and then there are, once you have a biofilm, there's measures to either reduce, totally kill, or physically remove. Um, next. Preventive is definitely the better choice um, because once you get a biofilm, it's it's difficult to get rid of them. So there's a lot of, of studies going on to, to focus on the preventive. Um, improved cleaning regimens, that's just um, common sense. Um, you know, if you're cleaner your pipe is, the less you just get rid of any bacteria even if it's planktonic, eventually it will want to settle and attach. So just keep it clean as much as you can. Um, some in industries, manufacturers are um, putting in you know, water purification systems upstream of some of their processes. They don't necessarily need sterile water, but they're finding that you know the biofilms is such an, an issue that it, it's beneficial to do some water purification. A lot of studies on um, antimicrobial coatings um, and closely related to that is a, a surface composition. So, you know, surface charge, um, hydrophobicity, wettability, roughness, you know, everything to do with surface is um, very important because the there's so many interactions between the bacterial components and the surface component. One of the problems with this is there's no, you know, one protein that all biofilms use. So you just need to come up with a product that can wipe out that that protein. You know, it doesn't work that easy, but they're still making strides. The last two, the um, adhesion inhibitors and signaling inhibitors, those are still more at the uh, basic research level. Um, they're powerful. Um, I don't know how easy they will be to, to scale up, but um, it's basically what I just said, that there's, there's a class of proteins called um, adhe adhesins that are on the bacterial surface, if you can find inhibitors of, of those proteins, they won't be expressed and therefore they can't adhere. Um, similarly, the um, signaling inhibitors, the um, EPS is re regulated, genetically regulated um, with cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP. So if you can inhibit that signaling pathway, it could also help the, um, the EPS from forming. Okay. So some of the um, 
after you have the biofilm, some of the methods people are using uh, reduct to reduce, kill, or remove chemicals. I mean, this we use for non biofilm bacteria, obviously, disinfectants, sanitizers, uh, sterilants. Um, but they don't really work that well for biofilm. So you have to use very high concentrations, which you know can either be toxic or um, can destroy a, a surface. So, but there's what has been done is in combination with heat and chemical that that's shown some uh, benefit or enzymes and chemicals. So an enzyme will start chopping away at the EPS so that the chemicals can get then get in and kill the, the bugs inside. Phage therapy is, is exciting. I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard, not just for biofilm, but phage therapy for a lot of things. Um, so it's been found that some phage can penetrate the the matrix, whereas um, you know, almost everything else can't. So that's um, that's uh, powerful. We'll see where uh, where that goes. And again, it's um, usually in combination with um, uh, with another mechanism. Um, then some physical, magnetic, and electrical fields, ultrasound, plasma and uh, irradiation. All those are, are being uh, pursued. Okay. Okay, so what are um, some of the test methods uh, out there to, to test the um, efficacy of some of these products? Okay, next. So as I just said, scientists and engineers are developing new um, technologies, which are which are fantastic, to combat biofilms, as well as methodologies to prove their performance. There's a lot of good stuff in the literature, um, the academic literature, where they've designed a you know an innovative product and they've tested it and it it looks good, um, but it does not go on the under the rigor of a standardized method. So from a regulatory perspective, standardized test methods are needed to evaluate the efficacy of a product or a, a process. So that's uh, an issue and you'll, you'll see, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, regulatory at the end. Okay, next. So some of the challenges to developing standardized methods for biofilm. As you can tell already, biofilms are complex. They are usually multi-species. They're not, they're very dynamic, um, not amenable to standardization. Every biofilm is unique, full of different uh, bacteria, different um, components in the, in the EPS. And they occur in such a wide variety of, in, of environments, making it you know, very difficult to design testing procedures. For example, you can design a, a test procedure for a tiny implant device. You probably need a different test procedure if you wanted to look at a two foot diameter water pipe. Um, so those are, those are problems and of course, all of our experience and knowledge has been based on antimicrobial test methods that were designed for bacteria and suspension. So, I mean, we can, of course, take some information from that, but we are almost starting from ground zero. Um, so due to all those reasons and more, it makes the evaluation of antibiofilm products very difficult and it requires specialized methods and some specialized equipment. Next. A um, couple more comments on, on the criteria. So say you are able to finally come up with a method, you wanna be sure um, 
that these critical factors were, were addressed. Um, probably one of the most important, and, and I, I see this as a, a mistake in, in, in some methods in the literature, and that's that you have confirmation that you indeed do have a biofilm with characteristic properties of a biofilm. You, you know, you don't want to be just doing log reductions on planktonic cells. Um, you want to be sure you have the, a biofilm, a proper biofilm. One of the most um, powerful, in my opinion, um, powerful way to, to determine that is with imaging. I know pretty high powered imaging, um, but, and it's also very, very satisfying um, when you get to see pictures and, and not just numbers. Um, proper and sufficient controls, that's, you know, really goes with all methods. Um, the next one is very important. Um, you need to have a very robust sampling method for recovering microorganisms from your surface. Um, because they adhere so tightly and are resistant to almost everything, you want to be sure you can recover them um, if, you, if you want to be quantitative at all. And then, of course, you want your method to simulate the real world situation as much as possible. Okay, all that said, next. There are ASTM biofilm methods. Um, I've listed not all of them here, but representative ones. Um, some of them just uh, have the method for growing the biofilm, and other ones include both growing and um, evaluating the efficacy of, of your product. Um, so I, I'm going to, let's see, look at the time. Yeah, I need to go a little faster. Okay, so I, I won't go through each of those methods, and then I just want to mention also there's a lot of non-standardized methods in the literature, not the ones I mentioned before, but these, like the colony biofilm method and Robin's model, have been out for out there forever. They're used all the time. They've just never been put through uh, a standard standardization organization, but they are good methods. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the first method I'm going to mention to you, I'm only going to talk about three to just give you an overview of the different kinds of, of standardized methods out there. So the first one is called either the Calgary Biofilm or the MBEC, which stands for Minimal Biofilm Eradication Concentration, I think. Um, so this is a very simple to do, relatively inexpensive very high throughput screening because, well, it, it's high throughput test. It's recommended to be used for screening, okay? Um, it's a non 96 well platform. You can test multiple products, concentrations, multiple bugs. Um, it, it's a good way to start if you have a product um, before you get into the more uh, laborious uh, models. Okay, next. So the way the, the MBEC works, um, it's basically a 96 well plate. You can see on the bottom right is, are the wells. The top, the, the lid is the only thing really different from a 96 well plate, a normal one. It has these little pegs um, attached to the lid. And those pegs can be made of any material. Uh, you can buy them commercially or you can have a, a, a whatever material you want made. So you can see on the left, um, there's one peg that has been submerged in um, probably growth media. You can see there the life cycle of a biofilm, the uh, bacteria adhering, forming a biofilm, and then shedding the life cycle we talked about. The nice thing is you can take this lid, um, so you would inoculate your 96 well plate. Oops. Yeah. 
Great. Okay. So you would inoculate the the bottom. Oh no. Okay. Um, so put your bacteria in the in the 96 well plates. I mean, obviously not all of them. You have controls, and then put your pegs in there. So you've basically inoculated your your pegs. And then after you've done that, you, you can let it go for however long you want. You can um, shake it. So it's pretty low shear, but, but you can introduce some, some shear. And you can move that lid and transfer it then to 96 well plates for rinsing, for product application, um, you name it. You know, however you want to design your experiment. It's, um, it's very, very nice. Um, and then at the end, you can put the lid in some buffer and actually sonicate it, and the bacteria will come off. The biofilm will be uh, the clumps declumped and disaggregated and go into the solution. And then you can either plate it on, on auger, or usually it's just looked at in a, spe a spectrophotometer. OK, next. Uh, this is just to show growth um, on the pegs of biofilm. Next. Okay, the CDC reactor. Um, next. Uh, I'll go real fast. So there's a couple of, of ASTM methods. This is a high shear condition. It's continuous flow. Um, and next. Oh, okay. So the, the last slide showed uh, the ASTM methods. The EPA also has written two of, of their internal SOPs. Basically, they are an interpretation of the two ASTM methods. Um, but of course, they recommend that you use their SOPs. Um, OK, next. So this is a CDC reactor schematic on the left and a picture on the right. So if you look at the picture, you can see it's a, a glass vessel. I think it holds like 500 ml. It's got eight holes on the top with um, that holds these rods. The rod is shown to the right of the vessel. And you can see in the rod, it has three uh, basically little holes where you can put in what we call coupons. Those coupons can be made of any material. Um, and they go, they're inserted into the vessel. You, um, you put media in there and your bug, and first it sits for 24 hours, um, and then you start a continuous flow of media to produce some shear, and there's also a stir, that rod you see between the um, second and third rod on the left is uh, a stir bar. So, um, Things are moving all the time. Okay, next. All right. Um, this on the right is just the setup, the whole setup. You can you can see um, the CDC reactor in, in green there, and it's hooked up to this big carboy of media. Uh, and between that is a pump that pumps the media through, and then it the the carboy on the ground is uh, the waste. Okay, next. All right, and this is once you've got your biofilm on those coupons, you can take them out and you put the first tube there, you rinse them in, in basically water. Um, I'm going to skip through this fast. Um, basically, what you're doing, you're, you're going to expose the, the coupon in the third tube there. You see a, a, a coupon, it's in the product, the anti-biofilm product for a contact time. Um, and then you add neutralizer in the fourth tube there. And then you um, you have to do the recovery sampling procedure, which is very important. It's um, five uh, versions of it, five sequential steps of uh, vortex sonicate, vortex sonicate, vortex for 30 seconds each time. And um, that was validated, and it's very critical. Okay, and then you just um, enumerate plate on, on auger plates and get your counts before and after treatment. Okay, next. 
Okay. Um, I've got two or three minutes. Uh, this is um, actually a study we just recently did. These are the top you can see is, is one of the rods. It just came out of the reactor and was rinsed. And this is a little hard to see. These are stainless steel coupons. And the bug that was used is um, Staph aureus. Doesn't make really thick biofilms, but I think you can see um, a film there on on the first one on the left is a little hard to see, and that's because the entire coupon is covered. So on the other two, you can still see some of the steel below. Um, okay, and then post-treatment, you can see it looks like all the biofilm is gone, right? It looks beautiful. Okay, next slide. So this is a uh, SEM image of the pre-treatment versus the post-treatment. So you can see there's still stuff left on there, even, even though to your eye, it doesn't look like there is. Um, and I believe if I recall the, the log reduction when we quantified on, on auger, um, it was like one, uh, you know, one to two logs, somewhere in there. Okay, next. Okay, last um, model is the drip flow reactor. I, I think this is my favorite. This is a, a low fluid shear. And instead of being submerged completely in water, like the MBEC and the CDC, um, it's at an air-liquid interface. It results in really thick biofilms, and it can be used to model um, wounds, um, lung, you know, lung tissue, anything that's kind of at teeth, anything that's got an air-liquid interface. Um, next. Um, on the right, so the, yeah, the, the last slide was a, a current model. The, the picture here on the right on this slide is, is an older model. You can see there's four little chambers and the, each chamber holds uh, basically a microscope slide. Uh, and okay, if you look at the uh, schematic on the left, you can see the, the apparatus, the reactor is at a slant. And you can see up the, on the left at the top, there's a, a tiny needle. I think it's, I don't know, 25 gauge. But so, you, and you can see a little drop. So you don't want this high shear flow. You want just drip, drip, drip. As if you, you know, you would get in these, these models, like, like a wound, for example. So then that rolls down, um, your slide goes there. This was a, Actually, it's something different I was doing. I, this is a, a piece of pig skin, but normally you just have your, your um, slide there and your slide can be made of any surface you would like. And then you have your waste going out and the little gizmo on the right, at the top of the reactor is a, a filter so that there's good um, air gas, uh, air exchange. Okay, next slide. Uh, on the left is just how it looks in the incubator. You know, you have a, you don't have to use as large volumes as you do for the CDC reactor. Um, so we just have a small flask. You see the pump on the first shelf and the second middle shelf. You see the reactor and then the bottom, the waste. So that's a typical experiment. On the right, you see um, after it's been incubated for the specified time, you see a, a biofilm form there on the slide. Okay. Um, okay, oh, next. So I will go through this really fast, um, unless Mike, you want me to stop. Um, let's see. Um, so, as I said, it took a long time for scientists to finally realize we need to pay attention to biofilms. Well, the regulatory agencies are dragging their feet even more than the scientists. Um, Fortunately, so there's not there's very little guidance and, and testing performance criteria. The EPA is doing pretty well. Um, they, they've actually helped quite a bit and um, it, it's, it's good news. FDA has at least used the word biofilm. There's no, you know, really concerted guidance, but, but they're coming around. Um, I won't mention um, Europe is doing great. What they've decided is it's so difficult to have one method to, because every biofilm, every 
medical device. They're, they're all so different. We can't do it. I mean, that's what's frustrating for the FDA. They want one method so they can make a blanket decision, but that's not possible. So Europe is leaning towards just give me good scientific sound experiments. We'll analyze it and decide if if you uh, performed a good a good experiment. Um, Health Canada is actually meant um, using some of the ASTM methods. They have mentioned that you can uh, you can use some of those. Next, ah, uh, so this is the guidance. Um, I'm not going to read through it. This is EPA's guidance. Um, it was if you just type in the title there, guidance to assess the efficacy of antimicrobial pesticide products. Just put in the word biofilm, you'll get it. It was uh, came out in 2016 or 2017. It's the only one out there, so you'll find it. And, and they give you all the, the testing criteria. Okay, next. This is Health Canada, next. Australia next. Summary. Um, okay, 10 seconds. Um, biofilms are the predominant form of life for the majority of microorganisms uh, in nature, not free floating. Biofilms are dynamic. They can become dormant. They can increase or decrease their growth rate depending on their needs to survive. Uh, the EPS is a major role, role player. Um, New approaches to control microbes are needed, um, and much more to be learned. Okay, <laughs> I think that's it. Oh yeah. Okay, so I don't know uh, for those of you who aren't aware. Um, so Terra Health, that's our parent company. Um, they have this great um, resource where um, they have experts in in the field with that have published, you know, some curated content, webinars, white papers, ebooks, um, a really nice resource. And you can um, reach that by the link there. And it's for free, free access. Okay. And last slide, um, just to um, acknowledge that uh, Soterra Health has three sister companies, Nelson Labs, Sterigenics, and um, Nor Nordion. Okay, thank you very much, and I apologize for going slow and then whizzing through. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mike. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for all of your insights, and uh, you've, you've presented a lot of great information today, um, giving us a lot to think about. Uh, we have a few questions. We'll take one or two here in the, in the last couple of minutes. And, uh, and then we'll wrap this up. And of course, if you have any questions that we did not get to, you're more than welcome to reach out to Dr. Butler um, at any time. So let's just go, uh, the first one here is, uh, can the CDC reactor be used to test porous surfaces? Um, okay, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. And that's discussed at a lot of the meetings. Um, Yes, um, but not without validating every step of the way. Um, two of the most critical issues are um, your recoveries. If your bacteria is going to get absorbed onto the porous material, you're not going to be able to um, recover it for um, quantifying. That's one. And, and also, we're not sure about how thick of a biofilm you you would you would get. So um I mean I, I know it's easier to start with a method that's already in place, um, but there would definitely be a lot of um modifications that have to be validated. But there's you know a lot it comes up all the time at the meetings. So people are definitely interested in it and um probably eventually we'll have one. Right, thank you. We'll take one more question here. Um, are there some examples of beneficial biofilms? 
Um, okay. Uh, yes, um, they can clean up oil spills. Um, they can clean up heavy metals. They, they convert organic carbon into just bacterial uh, mass, basically, and they serve as a, as a filter. Um, there are some, uh, I just, at the last meeting I attended, there was a, a talk about using um, fungal biofilms to make um, food in a high protein, rich in, in high protein. Um, so yeah, those are, are definitely the, the, the biofouling that occurs in an aircraft the biofilms reduce efficiency um, of, of that so much. So if we can um, figure out a way to actually use other biofilms to um, clean up oil, then it, it would help with that, with biofouling. Okay? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Butler. And, and thank you for this thorough and informative uh, presentation today. Um, we'd like to thank you uh, for presenting uh, your insights on this, and we'd also like to thank you, the viewer, for, for attending this session. We hope you found it to be a valuable experience. This session will be available on the Nelson Labs website in the next few days. Again, thank you for attending, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.